Greetings, loved ones. Much emphasis has been placed on appropriate skills for interviewing children about sexual abuse, but it is also important to develop approaches for asking children about their relationships with caregivers, experiences of discipline, some psychological maltreatment occurs in this context, and feelings of self-worth, safety, and being loved. Today, we're in part three of a four-part series on the psychological abuse of children. Help us get these messages out. Please subscribe to our channel, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, hit the like button and the notification bell, and please share these messages with others. You could save a life. So let's discuss assessment. This information applies to anyone who knows a child, but was specifically provided for the pediatrician so they can learn how to spot a child suffering psychological abuse. Psychological abuse poses a real challenge to pediatricians dedicated to ensuring the health and well-being of children. Pediatricians and others need to be alert to the possibility of psychological abuse and consider such exposure in any assessment of psychological and behavioral conditions in childhood. Just as history about a psychological or behavioral problem should be obtained from multiple informants whenever possible, this is also the case when considering whether a child is being exposed to psychological abuse. Much emphasis has been placed on appropriate skills for interviewing children about sexual abuse, but it is also important to develop approaches for asking children about their relationships with caregivers, experiences of discipline, because some psychological abuse occurs in this context, and feelings of self-worth, safety, and being loved. Once it is possible to interview a child from a developmental standpoint and the pediatrician is comfortable in doing so, an individual interview with a child becomes important for assessment of any concerns of major psychological or behavioral problems. Even very young children, once they are speaking in sentences and can often provide this information, it is important to interview children alone, away from caregivers, because they may be experiencing abuse from the very caregiver who accompanied them to the appointment. The pediatrician and others need to be aware of risk indicators for psychological abuse, such as parental psychiatric illness, including depression and substance abuse, among others. It is also important to be aware of the psychological abuse that can be accompany exposure to intimate partner violence or domestic violence. For children of all ages, major caregivers need to be interviewed, and this should be performed individually to ensure the par parent's safety when asking about such issues as domestic violence, and important information should be gathered from teachers and child care personnel. Even brief telephone contact with school or child care personnel can be helpful in assessing a child's exposure to psychological abuse. Because this can be time consuming, ideally the task of obtaining this information can be shared with another member of the pediatrician's office staff. Consultation with a pediatrician who has expertise in assessing child abuse or a mental health professional may assist the pediatrician in completing an assessment and plan. Although there are no specific physical indicators for psychological abuse, it is essential to assess a child's growth and development because these can be impaired in association with exposure to psychological abuse. The extent of impairment can, can vary. Severe forms of psychological deprivation can be associated with psychosocial short stature, a condition of short stature or growth failure formerly known as psychological psychosocial dwarfism. Observing a child and parents together can provide valuable information about the quality of their relationship and the ability of a parent to respond to a child, although appropriate behavior by a parent in context of a brief office visit does not rule out the possibility a child is experiencing psychological abuse. Conversely, a single interaction that is of concern between a parent and child is generally not diagnostic, diagnostic of psychological abuse. Close clinical follow-up may be needed to clarify any issues of concern. Reporting of psychological abuse can be difficult. In some jurisdictions, clear indication of impairment in growth and or development may be necessary for a child protective service agency to accept a report. Detailed documentation is essential in such situations. It is important that the pediatrician record specific statements from the child, the family, and other sources, and that the pediatrician is systematic in assessing the child's behavioral, psychological, and physical status in relation to the baseline assessment. For example, 
the pediatrician who has been providing general pediatric care to a child whose parents become involved in an extremely contentious custody or access dispute can alert the parents to the potential for the child to experience psychological trauma and can be aware of early indicators of impairment in the child. If identification for the parents of a child being exposed to potential psychological abuse does not lead to improvement in parenting behavior, the pediatrician can then make referrals to such services as mediation, mental health services, or child protective services. Careful follow-up is very important because parents who are psychologically abusive may not be reliable in providing information about their child's functioning for their own response to intervention. Prevention. Let's talk about prevention. The potential for major impairment associated with psychological abuse during the early years of life underscores the importance of identifying approach to intervention in infancy and toddlerhood. Prevention before occurrence involves the use of universal interventions aimed at promoting the type of parenting that is now recognized to be necessary for child op for optimal child development alongside the use of targeted interventions directed at improving parental sensitivity to infant cues. This would include, for example, the recommendation that all routine contact between professionals and parents be used as an opportunity to promote sensitive and attuned parenting using a range of approaches, including media-based strategies such as leaflets, books, and videos, among others and to observe and identify parent-child interactions that require further intervention using targeted approaches. Although it is unknown whether these strategies prevent psychological abuse, there is preliminary evidence to suggest that the use of population strategies of this nature show promise in the prevention of abuse generally. Targeted programs aimed at preventing early indicators of psychological abuse often focus on infants and younger children. Much less is known about approaches to preventing psychological abuse in the older age groups, specifically maternal insensitivity to infant cues, which is associated with insecure attachment, is a significant predictor, predictor of socioeconomic, socio-emotional maladaptation. Maternal insensitivity is an important element of psychologically harmful parent-child relationships, Brief focused interventions such as those involving video feedback and attachment discussion might improve insensitive parenting, but there is no direct evidence at this time that these interventions prevent psychological abuse. Furthermore, interventions to date have focused on maternal child interactions. It is important to address paternal child interactions as well as other significant caregiving relationships. One targeted program that has been shown effective in preventing child abuse generally is the Nurse Family Partnership, an intensive home visitation program provided by nurses to low-income first-time mothers beginning prenatally and during infancy. Because the goals of the NFP include assisting women to promote healthy prenatal behaviors and parents' competent care of their children, it is possible that the NFP could prevent psychological abuse as part of the overall reduction of abuse but its effectiveness in preventing this specific type of abuse has not been assessed. According to the CDC, over half of all children in the world, that is 1 billion children ages 2 to 17, experience violence every year. The question is not if you'll encounter a victim of violence. The question before God is what will you do when you do encounter them? You could save a life. Micah 6.8 says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? You are called. We are all called to be champions for justice. If you're a victim of violence, listen to me. You are valued. You are loved. You are intelligent and you are worthy. I want you to know that there is a way out and it's not your fault. Abuse is not love. And most of all, I want you to know that you are not alone. If you're suffering violence, reach out to someone today. If you find yourself in a dangerous situation, call 911 for help. If you know of a child or other person suffering violence, tell the authorities. Our next episode is the last in a four-part series of psychological abuse of children. So until then, God bless you.